What's up you guys, Dr. Gooden back with another lecture video. Today we're talking about speed and agility training. This comes from chapter 19 of the CSCS textbook. Dr. Gooden here back with another lecture. Oh, yeah. At the bell. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, professor of kinesiology here at Point Loma Nazarene University. And today we're gonna to be talking about speed and agility training. This is gonna be part one of three, covering the information in chapter 19 of the CSCS textbook. Now this chapter was written by Dr. Brad DeWeese and Dr. Sophia Nymphius. Dr. DeWeese was actually my thesis mentor when I was in grad school. So Dr. DeWeese, if you're watching this, I hope to do you justice. If I get anything wrong though, just let me know in the comments. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the neurophysiological basis of speed. Now, first we have to define some key terms. Speed, when we say speed, we're referring to the skills and abilities needed to achieve high movement velocities. Change of direction, different from speed, these are skills and abilities needed to explosively change movement direction, velocities, or modes. So this is accelerating, decelerating, planting, pivoting, those types of actions. Agility is when we add in some sort of a response to a stimulus. So this would be the skills and abilities needed to change direction, velocity, or mode in response to a stimulus. So there's a cognitive and there's um, a perceptual component to agility. Speed requires the ability to accelerate and reach maximal velocity, but this is only referring to just straight line maximal velocity. We're not talking about decelerating. We're not talking about change of direction or any sort of stimulus response. Agility performance requires the use of perceptual cognitive ability in combination with the ability to decelerate and then re-accelerate in an intended direction. So it's not just the force that you can apply into the ground linearly, or even the force that you can apply into the ground in the right directions to reorient your center of mass, but we also have this perceptual cognitive component in agility. Let's talk about speed and agility mechanics. Now, in order to execute movement techniques, athletes must skillfully apply force. It's not just about how much force can you produce, it's can you produce that force in the right direction through the appropriate limbs in a constrained amount of time because we know that the foot spends a limited amount of time on the ground. So due to that limited time to produce force during athletic activities, there are two variables that describe force relative to the time available to produce force. This would be rate of force development, or RFD, and impulse. So let's further define these two. Impulse is the change in momentum resulting from a force measured as the product of force and time. So it's really force over time is impulse. It's how it's like the cumulative force over a certain time window. If your foot spends 100 milliseconds on the ground, how much force did you produce during that 100 milliseconds? Did it take you a long time to get there? Or did you uh, quite rapidly achieve that peak force during your window and stay at that peak force the entire time? A basic objective of training is to move the force time curve up and to the left, generating greater impulse and momentum during the limited time over which force is applied. So let's say that we have force and time. And if you go from something like this, let's say that this is, um, I don't know, 120 milliseconds. Um, so if this is your force time curve, then all of this shaded area would be the impulse. But let's say that you move that curve up and to the left and now it's something like that. And now you have all of this extra force over time or greater impulse with which to propel your body down the track. Uh, or rather this would be, let's say that this is vertical force. Uh, so with which to um, impart that force and keep your body vertical at those max velocities uh, resulting in a greater stride length. Now that was impulse, rate of force development is the development of maximal force in minimum time, typically used as an index of explosive strength. So if you've ever looked at any type of uh, uh, max effort isometric drill or test, like an isometric mid-thigh pull or an iso squat, you know that we want to try to get those athletes to pull or to push as fast and as hard as possible. It's not about ramping up peak force if you do it slowly because then that curve 
goes up gradually. We want them to hit it hard so that all of their force is unleashed at once and so that curve is as vertical as possible. And the slope of that curve is what we call RFD or rate of force development. We can look at RFD at different time windows, 50 milliseconds, which tends to be somewhat unreliable um, just because it's hard to really determine where the initiation of that pull begins sometimes uh, with whether you're using an algorithm or you're using the trusty you know I method to look for that for that inflection point. Um, 100 milliseconds is a little bit more reliable than 150 and 200 milliseconds up to 250 milliseconds and all of these correspond with different ground contact times. So in uh, maximal velocity maybe we want to look at that 100 millisecond window or let's say that we're working with distance athletes and their foot spends a little bit more time on the ground. Maybe we look at 200 milliseconds, or maybe we're interested more in uh, jumping ability. So maybe we look at 200 to 250 milliseconds of RFD. Now with impulse and RFD, those two metrics, of course, are all about the forces that you can produce. In the physics of sprinting, change of direction, and agility, force represents the interaction between two physical objects. In this case, that's going to be the ground and the athlete's body or their center of mass. Acceleration is the change in an object's velocity due to movement of mass. Velocity describes how fast an object is traveling and in what direction. So hopefully you recall some of your biomechanics or physics lessons as we're getting into these definitions because they're very, very important. All we're describing is the motion of an object and the force required to impart certain accelerations to that object, uh, thus making it achieve certain velocities. So here are two graphs showing sprint ground reaction force and impulse. So graph A over here is looking at the acceleration phase. Note that the foot spends a bit more time on the ground, 0.15 seconds or 150 milliseconds. The ground contacts are longer in the acceleration phase. You can see in the blue, the horizontal force and in purple is a vertical force, note that we express much more vertical force even in the acceleration phase, even when the body is positioned down like we'll see later in this series um, in order to accelerate as quickly as possible and impart that force horizontally, there's still a huge vertical component. Now on the left side, we have the braking impulse. This is all of the force over time required to stop the body from falling you know, down to the track. We have to resist gravity or break against gravity. Um, and we also have to get that foot underneath the body. Everything to the right of that, uh, which you know, intersects right with the peak of the graph here, of the force time graph, is propulsive force. And this force is all being used to propel the body up and forward uh, into that flight time. Now, if we take a look to the right at the max velocity phase, we're going to see a much steeper spike in force, a much greater rate of force development. This happens when the foot impacts the ground and we have that initial spike all the way up here. And this is, uh, again, the braking impulse. And then on this side, we have the propulsive impulse. Note now that we are spending about 120 milliseconds on the ground instead of 150. So the uh, ground contact time is shorter, the window to express forces is shorter, and the um, forces during that time are much higher. So after examining these graphs, we have to remember that in addition to the requirement for acceleration, the production of braking forces over certain periods of time, termed braking impulse, which we just looked at, should be considered during change of direction and agility maneuver. So it's not all about just accelerating, but as you're slowing down and decelerating, those braking forces are, are going to be much higher than the propulsive forces, obviously, because we want a net um, negative acceleration so that the velocity slows to a stop before changing directions. And of course, this happens very quickly. So um, when you're watching it to the eye, it doesn't look like the athlete stops. But just like in a jump, when you hit the apex and you're at zero velocity and then you go the other way, when that athlete plants their foot, they're decelerating all the way down to zero. If uh, let's say they're doing a 180 degree change of direction um, before they can start going the other way. It happens very quickly. And those braking forces, the braking impulse need to be considered. So far, we've been talking about the kinetics of sprinting, the forces and the impulse and the rate of force, but we also have to talk about the neurophysiological basis for speed. So when we're talking about the nervous system, we know that increases in neural drive, which are indicative of an increase at the rate of action potentials, 
are related to an increase in both muscular force and the rate of force production. Okay, so neural drive, that means the, the rate of action potential is sent you know, from your brain down to the spinal cord and then through the alpha motor neurons to those high threshold motor units. The rate of those, uh, if there's an increase in them, we have an increase in both the muscular force production and the rate of that force production. So higher peak force and higher RFD. Taken together, an increase in neural drive may contribute to increases in an athlete's RFD and impulse generation. This will have implications later when we talk about uh, training interventions to enhance speed and to enhance change of direction performance. We also have to remember that the stretch shortening cycle plays a huge role in sprinting and change of direction. So remember from chapter 18 when we talked about plyometrics that the stretch shortening cycle is an eccentric concentric coupling phenomenon in which the muscle tendon complex is rapidly and forcibly lengthened or stretched under load and then immediately shortened in a reactive or elastic manner. So we are storing that force elastically during the eccentric muscle action. Then there's that brief amortization phase, which we, we try to make as brief of, as possible by making our athletes strong and developing a healthy, strong stretch shortening cycle, followed by a concentric muscle action in which all of that energy is released. All the elastic energy is released and it's added to the concentric muscle action. Now remember that the stretch shortening cycle takes into account, or, or rather it takes advantage of, two phenomena. The first is the intrinsic muscle tendon behavior. Okay, so that's the elastic properties of the muscle, the series elastic component and the parallel elastic component, as well as the contractile components, and also the force and length reflex feedback system of the nervous system. So this is the myotatic or the stretch reflex whereby we have, because of this rapid stretch, uh, we have that signal, that feedback loop to the spine to get the alpha motor neuron to send even more action potentials to the muscle to get it to contract um, strongly and very quickly. So when we do things like plyometrics, uh, which involve the stretch shortening cycle, these actions tend to increase mechanical efficiency and impulse via elastic energy recovery. Also, when done chronically, they upregulate muscle stiffness and enhance neuromuscular activation. Long story short, plyometrics help to improve your speed and agility uh, through upregulating the muscle stiffness as well as enhancing the elastic qualities of the muscles themselves. Now, an important mathematical model to know about um, is the spring mass model. So this depicts sprinting as a type of human locomotion in which the displacement of body mass is the after effect from energy produced and is delivered through the collective coiling and extension of spring-like actions within muscle architecture. So essentially the spring mass model says that your muscles act like a spring that coils and then uncoils um, as you are running. So every step is like a coiling of a spring during the stance phase and then the uncoiling um, launches you into that flight phase. And we can model it with a graph similar to the one seen here. So this would be on the x-axis percent contact time, so whether it's a short contact time or a long contact time. And we just see that at peak force, or let's start here at zero, uh, when there's no force applied, when you're in the air, that spring is long and uncoiled. And then it coils as it hits the ground and you achieve peak force here at the top and then uncoils again, and is long, as you enter the next flight phase. Now we know that a mathematical model does not exactly mimic what the actual human leg does because of all of its intricacies plus the individual differences from human to human. However, it does model it fairly closely. Here we see an example of uh, two different foot strikes superimp superimposed over the spring mass model. You can see how the spring mass model somewhat predicts the impulse and the peak force of any, in any given step. However, in example one and example two, you see the R squared value, which is uh, essentially the similarity between the two uh, as being 0.78 and 0.92. So sometimes it models a foot strike fairly well, sometimes it's a little bit further off. However, it does a decent enough job. So during the stance phase, the model demonstrates how the leg, which is represented as a spring, as I said, is uncompressed at, an, at initial contact, and then is compressed during mid-stance, 
or as vertical ground reaction force increases. In more advanced biomechanics courses, you would use the spring mass model to predict and to model uh, human locomotion to much greater degrees of accuracy. But this is just you know, a super brief introduction into what that concept actually is. Because a lot of the research, a lot of the kinetic research into sprinting uses that model as, the, as sort of the starting point. The key point here is that as sprinting requires an athlete to move at high speeds, strength and conditioning professionals should emphasize the prescription of exercises that have been shown to increase neural drive while overloading musculature of the hip and knee regions involved in the stretch shortening cycle. So because our leg muscles and our leg in general uh, functions like a giant spring, and because of that neurophysiological basis for speed that we talked about, we want to employ exercises that increase neural drive, right? So things that have high neural drives like maybe the Olympic weightlifting movements um, or plyometrics and things that uh, get the stretch shortening cycle involved, like again, the Olympic weightlifting movements and plyometrics. So far we've been talking about linear speed mostly, but what about change of direction? Well, during that plant, the plant phase, which is the moment between deceleration and acceleration, we have the plant phase of a change of direction movement. Here's the plant foot of the person in this example picture. This is the point in a change of direction movement that represents the transition between the deceleration step and the acceleration step. Body positioning and the ability to maintain strong trunk positions during the deceleration of momentum and reorientation of the body to run in a new direction are critical to performance. So if we even if we just look at this person here with her knee, ankle, hip joint, right? We can see that they're pretty much in line and force is being applied from her foot into the ground and then back into her body. And she has a good strong trunk position here that's vertical. What we see a lot of times with uh, you know, people with um, weak trunks or poor positioning is that this knee is going to cave inward into a valgus. Uh, their trunk is going to maybe come down this way, right? With excessive lean, uh, maybe some lumbar flexion and lateral flexion as they cave forward into the side and, they, and their center of mass wants to go this way. Right, the center of mass wants to keep going that way because of their momentum and they're not strong enough to fully redirect their center of mass in the other way. So, so uh, strong trunk and core musculature is very important with that. But we want to be sure that we're not just training endurance with the trunk musculature and uh, that when we're training the trunk, we train it so that we can access that strength with the movement patterns, right? If doing a thousand crunches isn't going to help you have strong trunk positioning. We, have, we want to do plyometric high force movements for the trunk so that we can synchronize it with the forces of the lower leg when you're changing directions. So let's transition to talking about running speed. So, so what creates running speed and what separates uh, fast sprinting from slower sprinting? Um, sprinting is a series of coupled flight and support phases known as strides orchestrated in an attempt to displace the athlete's body down the track at maximal acceleration or velocity, usually for brief distances. In a track meet, uh, you see you know, the shortest race being the 60 meter sprint or the 60 meter dash. The 100 meter, the 200 meter, the 400 meter is usually the longest race that we call the sprint. I hear, I've heard people say that the 800 meters is a long sprint and it is a fast run, but you know, it's not a sprint. Uh, it's, it's kind of like that gray area between a distance event because you need to have stamina and a sprinting race because you have to have speed. But really the 400 is kind of where the sprints uh, top out. And if you check out Dr. Wayan's research, really everything from the 400 meter and down is uh, limited not by your energy reserves, but more by the rate at which you can use anaerobic energy. Anything above that and now we're getting um, you know, more oxidative and there's a, a much different component. It's more metabolically limited, whereas the 400 and down at the elite level is limited more by how much force can you produce and how quickly can you produce it. Now the key point here is that sprint speed is determined by an athlete's stride length times their stride rate or their stride frequency. More successful sprinters tend to have longer stride lengths as a result of properly directed forces into the ground, while also demonstrating a more frequent stride rate. These findings suggest that RFD and proper biomechanics are two of the primary limiting factors influencing sprint performance. 
So let's take a look at this graphically. This shows stride length and frequency interaction as a function of running velocity. So each of these points represents a different running velocity, four, five, six meters per second, all the way up to 10 meters per second. And what I want you to notice about this graph is that initially we see that there are huge increases in stride length. So from four to five, we go from 1.5 meters to a little over 1.7 meters in stride length, up to six meters per second, and we go up to almost two meters in stride length. However, stride length can only increase so much. It, once we get up to seven and then eight meters per second, the increase in stride length starts to plateau. It starts to level out until we see at eight, nine, and 10 meters per second, that stride length is very similar. So um, it really caps out at around 2.2 meters or just over that in most individuals. However, it's the stride frequency at this point that increases dramatically. So now we start to see, uh, whereas initially we had these little increases in stride frequency going from 2.8 to 3 to 3.2 ish, or just under that in those earlier um, sprint speeds from, let's look at the top two from nine to 10, that's 4.2 all the way up to over 4.6, let's call it 4.7 steps per second. So initially it's increases in stride length and then it increases in stride rate or frequency that will allow a sprinter to continue making those improvements in top speed. Um, here is a look at novice versus elite sprinters. So stride length in novice sprinters is around two and a half meters in length. And this is at their top running velocity. This is their max speed. Whereas in elite sprinters, they've extended that to 2.7. And this is primarily a function of how much force can they put into the ground and how quickly can they do it. When we look at the max rate or the, the uh, step frequency of elites versus novices, novices have just over 4.4 steps per second, whereas elite runners have just over 4.6 steps per second. So we see an improvement in both the stride length and the stride frequency going from novice to elite. But um, early on, most of those gains are going to be made in stride length and secondarily in stride frequency as you go uh, through those different speeds as we saw in the previous graph. Now, what your athlete needs to work on or what your athletes need to work on is highly dependent because you can see people who are out there spinning their wheels with very high stride frequencies, but the stride length is an issue. They're not really going anywhere. And then you see those people, it looks like they're running in slow motion because they're overstriding. Maybe they're impacting with their foot way out in front of them. And that overstriding, uh, trying to gain another inch with every step, not only leads to poor biomechanics and a lot of braking forces, but it's a suboptimal way to run. So they have the length there, they probably need to actually bring it in a little bit, but they need to work on the stride frequency. So speaking of improving the agility and the speed of your athletes, the next video is going to get into the basics of technique for top speed and agility performance. Now it's not gonna go through an entire program um, or a, a super detailed biomechanical analysis, but I think it would be a good jumping off point for you as a future strength and conditioning coach, or just as a coach who you know, is wanting to level up your understanding of the speed training and the agility, agility training process, it would be a good jumping off point for you to get that overview. So check out that video. It should pop up somewhere on the screen. If you guys have any questions, let me know down in the comments and I'll see you on the next video. Today, we're talking about chapter 19 in the CSCS. Take two. What's up you guys, Dr. Good and Bad.